president hoped to overcome that poor debate performance a couple of weeks ago and concerns about his mental acuity with a news conference last night at the close of the NATO summit. He did have some gaffes, but also showed strong command of key issues, particularly on foreign policy. Behind the scenes, though, advisors and close allies are said to be making the case for why he should step aside. We'll go through our new reporting from NBC News. Also on Capitol Hill, more Democratic lawmakers calling on the president to withdraw from the race over concerns he cannot defeat Donald Trump in November. Good morning. Welcome to Morning Joe. It is Friday, July 12th. I'm Willie Geis. With us, we have the host of Way Too Early, White House Bureau Chief at Politico, Jonathan Lemire, MSNBC contributor Mike Barnacle, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist and associate editor of The Washington Post, Eugene Robinson, and President Emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas. A great group assembled this morning. Our reporters coming in in just a moment. Let's dive right into President Joe Biden's high stakes press conference last night on the final day of this week's NATO summit in Washington. As more members of his own party call for him to exit the race, the president took questions from reporters for nearly an hour yesterday and gave no indication he plans to end his campaign. In fact, the contrary. How the next two weeks go, will that affect your decision? Or are you fully determined on running uh, in November as the party's nominee? I'm determined on running. But I think it's important that I, real, I lay fears by seeing, let them see me out there. I'm going to be going around making the case of the things that I think we have to finish and how we can't afford to lose what we've done or backslide on civil rights, civil liberties, women's rights. There's that little button we have. Control guns, not girls. I mean, the idea we're sitting around. This is where Kamala is so good as well. We're sitting around. More children are killed by a bullet than any other cause of death. The United States of America. What the hell are we doing? What are we doing? We've got a candidate saying, promise the NRA, don't worry, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to do anything. we got a Supreme Court that is what you might call the most conservative court in American history. This is ridiculous. <clears throat> the presidency is the most straining job in the world, and it's 24-7. How can you say you'll be up for that next year, in two years, in four years, given the limits you've acknowledged that you have today? The limits I've acknowledged I have? There's been reporting that you've acknowledged that you need to go to bed earlier and your evening around 8. That's not true. Look, <laughs> what I said was, Instead of my every day starting at 7 and going to bed at midnight, it'd be smarter for me to pace myself a little more. And I said, for example, the 8, 7, 6 stuff, instead of starting a fundraiser at 9 o'clock, start at 8 o'clock. People get to go home by 10 o'clock. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about. And if you look at my schedule since I've since I made that stupid mistake of in the campaign in the, in the debate, I mean, my schedule has been full bore. I've done, where's, and where's Trump been? Riding around in his golf cart, filling out his scorecard before he hits the ball? How can you uh, reassure the American people that you won't have uh, more bad nights, whether they be on a debate stage or on some matter of foreign policy? Well, I tell you what, um, the best way to assure them is the way I assure myself. And that is, am I getting the job done? Am I getting the job done? Can you name me somebody who's gotten more major piece of legislation passed in three and a half years? I got created 2,000 jobs just last week. So if I slow down, I can't get the job done. That's a sign that I shouldn't be doing it. But there's no indication of that yet. You earlier explained confidence in your vice president. Yes. If your team came back and showed you data that she would fare better against former President Donald Trump, would you reconsider your decision to stay in the race? No, unless they came back and said, there's no way you can win. Me. No one's saying that. No poll says that. 
the president last night, speaking for nearly an hour there at that press conference at the end of the NATO summit. So, Eugene Robinson, we did have a couple of more Democrats in the House come out just after that press yeah. conference and say that Joe Biden needed to step aside despite a performance that I think most people believe was obviously much, much better than the debate mm -hmm. performance. You couldn't get much worse than that, but he looked and sounded better last night than he has recently. So what is your sense? Did that do anything to at least buy him some time? Did that do anything to change minds of people who were worried about him? Well, you know, we'll see how much time it, it bought him. I mean, uh, Congressman uh, Jim Hines from Connecticut uh, came out with his statement uh, uh, calling on President Biden to step aside minutes after the press conference ended. The press conference itself, I thought, was good. I mean, was 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 affirmatively good for Biden in that he he showed a mastery of foreign policy that he is he is he is exhibited for many years. Um, little flubs were uh, the same flubs that Joe Biden has been making for 30, 40 years. Uh, nothing to see there. Um, the problem, of course, is that he's trying to unring the bell that was rung in the debate. Uh, and that's a very difficult task. The other problem is that his numbers. Um, you know, the, the Washington Post poll that, that came out uh, yesterday showed uh, him uh, tied with Donald Trump nationally. That was kind of an outlier. Most of the polls, uh, respectable polls, have him a bit behind. The, uh, the average of polls has him three points behind. And in 2016 and in 2020, when we got to Election day, there Trump voters showed up who hadn't really been uh, found by the pollsters. Uh, he did a bit better than predicted. Four years ago, at this point, Biden was ahead of Trump by nine points, um, and so those are also data points that uh, that that don't inspire a lot of confidence among Democrats, especially Democrats on the Hill who were worried about their own races. So we had a, just actually a few moments ago, a new poll came out. We talked about that Washington Post poll yesterday that showed the president tied with former President Trump. This morning, it's an NPR Marist poll that shows Joe Biden up two points on Donald Trump in a national race. That's within the margin of error. Of course, though, the concern, Richard Haas, is in the swing states where Donald Trump has widened his lead a little bit in places that, frankly, that that Joe Biden has to win. There's no option anymore. The margin of error is so small. He has to win places like Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Obviously, there's no other path to victory. You have called over the last couple of weeks, Richard, for the president to step aside to make way for another candidate because you don't believe that Joe Biden can beat Donald Trump and the stakes are too high. What did you make of what you saw last night? Did it do anything to change your mind? Short answer is no, but let me tell you how I got there, Willie. I thought, like you all, the president did a really good job last night on foreign policy. That was a sophisticated, thoughtful, nuanced conversation of some really complex issues. Let's just, just say that very few people in public or private life could have sustained that kind of uh, a, a conversation. The problem was, though, there were still some flubs, which uh, people have focused on. He still comes off. The affect is still someone who's old. The voice is what it is. The walk is what it is. Also, foreign policy is not a subject that most Americans wake up ready to, to focus on. Uh, but I think he probably strengthened the odds, not settled it, but increased the odds he will be the candidate. But I think he's still got five weeks to the convention, so that, that, still, that pot still boils. The real question to me is, should he be the candidate? And there, I, I still have doubts. I'll be honest with you. He doesn't. He can't do anything about the fact he's an incumbent in an era in which virtually every incumbent recently has lost. If you look again at India, South Africa, Britain, France, it's a very, very rough time to be an incumbent. The issues that have hurt him still hurt him, uh, given the history of the border and immigration, given Gaza, even if we are perhaps getting near some... Uh, some progress there. Food prices are still higher than they were three and a half years ago. And the age issue is just one that you can never, ever, ever put behind you 100 percent. He's always one flub away, one trip away. And if the whole goal is to make this a referendum on Donald Trump, 
I don't think he's there. And to me, the, I think other candidates on the Democratic side would be better positioned to make this a referendum on Donald Trump. I'm not sure how Joe Biden ever turns the corner. So this is not a referendum on, on him. And if it is a referendum on him, he's not going to be the next president of the United States. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more, September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.